can handle the holy me and you can handle the Sunday me, but, but you ain't ready for my Friday night me. You, you ain't ready for the real me that I'm dealing with. I, I need some folk that can handle the real me. Can you handle the fact that I love Jesus, huh, but I cuss a little bit every now and then? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and foes, came upon me to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise, in this one thing will I be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me. In the time of trouble, he shall hide me. In the time of trouble, the Lord shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock and now will my head be lifted above my enemies all around me. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And again, I say, wait on the Lord. God, thank you for hiding us in times of trouble. Lord, I ask that you would speak in this moment that our hearts might hear and receive and bear fruit of your word on this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On the preaching calendar, I was supposed to preach from John 11 this morning about the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But Drew, something happened on Thursday in the barber shop that changed the message. And I would that you allow me to follow the leading of God and invite you, rather than to the Gospel of John, into the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles in the 29th, and 30th chapters, there's an extended portion of reading. I don't apologize for reading a lot of the Word of God, but I pray that you be able to bear patient with me. Second Chronicles 29 and 30. I'll give you a moment to find it. It's right after First Chronicles, <laughs> if that helps. And once you have found Second Chronicles, if you're physically able, we invite you to stand that together we might reverence the reading of the Word of God in the New International Version of Second Chronicles Chapter 29, beginning in verse number 1. If you're there, won't you say amen? amen? Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites, assembled them in the square on the east side and said, listen to me, Levites, consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all defilement from the sanctuary. Our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and forsook him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. They did not burn incense or present any burnt offerings at the sanctuary to the God of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread and horror and scorn, as you can see with your own eyes. This is why our fathers have fallen by the sword and why our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity. Now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. Verse 31. Then Hezekiah said, you have now dedicated yourselves to the Lord. Come and bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the temple of the Lord. So the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings, and all whose hearts were willing brought burnt offerings. The number of burnt offerings the assembly brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, and 200 male lambs, 
all of them for burnt offerings to the Lord. The animals consecrated as sacrifices amounted to 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep and goats. The priests, however, were too few to skin all the burnt offerings. So their relatives, the Levites, helped them until the task was finished and until other priests had consecrated, had been consecrated, for the Levites had been more conscientious in consecrating themselves than the priests had been. There were burnt offerings in abundance together with the fat of the fellowship offerings and the drink offerings that accompanied the burnt offerings. So the service of the temple of the Lord was reestablished. Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced at what God had brought about for his people because it was done so quickly. Keep reading, Pastor. Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. The king and his officials and the whole assembly in Jerusalem decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month. Someone say second month. They had not been able to celebrate it at the regular time because not enough priests had consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled in Jerusalem. The plan seemed right both to the king and to the whole assembly. They decided to send a proclamation throughout Israel from Beersheba to Dan, calling the people to come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. It had not been celebrated in large numbers according to what was written. As we meditate on that extended passage, I want to talk today about fixing a broken church. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. While at the barber shop on Thursday waiting to get a haircut, my barber introduced me to a brother in that place who was visibly upset. He told them I was a pastor of a local church and I went over and began to speak to him. While speaking with him, he informed me of all the things that were going on and going wrong in his life. He told me about his recent medical crisis, told me about some marital issues he was having with his wife, shared with me the financial troubles of their home, shared with me that he had recently been laid off, that his mother was in hospice, and his daughter had to run away from home. And after hearing all that was going on and all that was going wrong in his life, I did what I hope you would do as a believer. I offered to pray with him. And right there in the barbershop on Thursday morning, I prayed with that brother over all the things going on and going wrong in his life. After the amen, I then did what I knew a pastor ought to do. I extended an invitation for him to come to church. Not just any church, but a phenomenal, amazing, beautiful church <laughs> on the corner of Duke and Alfred Street in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. Because in my mind, what this brother needed was a good dose of worship. He needed to be in a place where he could feel the inescapable presence and glory of God. He needed to be in a setting where he heard the praises of God in song and in shout. Need to be around some folk who struggled like he was and came to church to find some hope and some healing. Let me ask you, have, have you ever had a really bad week? I mean, where if it wasn't one thing, it was another? And it crossed your mind to stay at home on Sunday? But you got up that day and pushed and pressed your way into the house of God only to find out that coming to church was the best thing you could have ever done that week to get yourself in order. Don't fool me now. Is there anybody here that's ever been glad to make it to the house of God? It was David who said, one thing have I desired of God that I may dwell in the house of God because there's just something about coming to church. I extended him an invitation to come to church, not just any church, but a phenomenal church, an amazing church on the corner of Duke and Alfred Street in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. And Mark, his response to me almost knocked me off my feet. He looked me dead in my eye, and this is what he said. I'll never set foot in another, 
And then he used two expletive vulgarities. <laughs> Church in my life. I will never set foot in another church. I'll let you fill in the blanks. You, you ain't that saved. You know what he said. <laughs> and he began to share with me all of the bad experiences he's had in church since the time he was a child and told me he never set foot in another church again and got up and left. But you know what? All of us know a couple somebodies who have a real bad taste in their mouths when it comes to church. Some folk who never want to set foot in church again. All you need to do is go online and see how the church has been subject to skepticism and even hostility from a generation that has been raised with no reverence or respect for the house of God. Beloved, I was drawn to that this week in a conversation comedian D.L. Hughley was having on his radio show. And in that show, he invited a bunch of haters from church and they got together and they talked about the church like a dirty dog. He said, the church is just a waste of time. Church ain't nothing but that that takes money from poor people and doesn't do anything to help change their community. He said, church is full of hypocrites. And he doesn't go because church is full of hypocrites. Well, so is your job. <laughs> but, but that don't keep you from going every day. He said, church is an entity that doesn't use the power it has to confront evil in our society. And he said, church was just a waste of time. And beloved, I get it, because you know what? Church at its worst ain't nothing but a waste of time. Church at its worst is little more than Sunday sanctified entertainment. Church at its worst is nothing more than a gathering of hypocrites who shout to God but won't live for God the next day. Church at its worst is nothing more than a place where ego is fed and power is sought after. Church at its worst is a sleeping giant that endorses systems of oppression in our nation and never lived to make a change in the lives of those who are hurt the most. Church at its worst is a waste of time. And church at its worst is an offense to the God we serve. If you read through scripture, you will find that God always expresses displeasure when God's people gather in God's house and don't live up to what God has called us to be. You, you, you only have to read in the Old Testament to find out that the house of God was always indicative of how close the people were to God. In the Old Testament, you'll find that when the people of God strayed from God, you could look at the house of God and see its disrepair and know they were not living faithfully to God. So when God ushers in religious revival and reformation and reform, it always began with repair. Read your Bible. When God calls God's people back to him, God demands that the people get the house of God in order. Because God says, you can't be right with me and my house be broken. So God calls the reformation and the repair of his holy house whether that was the tabernacle meeting, whether it was the tent, whether it was the temple, whether it was the synagogue, God said, get my house in order. That's what's happening here in 2 Chronicles 29 and 30. In 2 Chronicles 29 and 30, the children of Israel have strayed from God under the leadership of a wicked king named Ahaz. Ahaz is arguably the worst king Israel has ever known. 
He leads the people farther away from God than any predecessor. And when he dies, his son Hezekiah becomes king. And praise God, Hezekiah ain't like his daddy. Hezekiah loves the Lord. Hezekiah wants to do right by God. Hezekiah wants the people to live right by God. And as a result, Hezekiah hears God command him to fix the stuff that's broken in his house that his daddy Ahaz had messed up. God calls Hezekiah to fix the house of the Lord as a way of fixing the nation. This is what Hezekiah finds out. If we can fix the house of God, the people will get right. If the people get right, the families will be right. If the families get right, the schools will get right. If the schools get right, the community will get right. If the community gets right, City Hall will get right. If City Hall gets right, the chief of police gets right. If the chief of police gets right, police relations get right. If police relations get right, incarcerations go down. If incarcerations go down, employment goes up. If employment goes up, median income rises. If median income rises, people will be more invested in community. If they get more invested, voter registration goes up. If voter registration goes up, we can get rid of 45 and make our way to 46. That it all starts in the house of God. So God says, fix my house. Because if the church gets right, the nation must follow. And so Hezekiah comes to power, and he's got to fix some things that are broken. As a matter of fact, there are four things that were broken in that house of God that still affect churches and houses of God to this day. Four things that need to be fixed in order for the church to be what God has called it to be. Can I give them to you real quick? The very first thing Hezekiah does right here in the beginning, he comes to the house of God and the Bible says he opens the doors of the house of the Lord and repairs them. He fixes broken doors. Now, the reason that's so important is you must remember that in the house of the Lord, you could not enter in through any door you wanted to. It wasn't like church today where you could just sneak in whatever door was open. That's not how it worked. Every door to the temple was designated to a particular socioeconomic, gender, religious, ethnic background, which means that you had to find the door that matched who you were. There was a door for the Israelite men to walk through. There was a door for the Israelite women to walk through. There was a door for the Levites and the priests, the holy folk to go through. There was a door for the sick and the lame to go through. There was even a door for the Gentiles who weren't even religious but wanted to watch worship in the outer court. Everybody had a door. And during the reign of Ahaz, Hezekiah's daddy, all the doors were shut except the door for the Levites and the priests. There was no door for the sick. There was no door for the women. There was no door for the poor. There was no door for the orphans. There was no door for the Gentile. The only door that existed were for Levites and priests. Now, here's the problem. Levites and priests were the holy folk. Levites and priests were the ones who had memorized scripture. Levites and priests were the ones who knew the third verse of Amazing Grace. <laughs> Levites and priests had degrees in religion. And so on any given worship, the only folk who could get in were the ones who were holy and righteous and pretended to be perfect. And Hezekiah said, we got to fix that. Because for the house of God to be correct, 
it cannot be limited to people who have degrees in religiosity and look like they are perfect, but there has to be a door for everybody to come through and be in the house of the Lord. The problem with that church that affects many of us today is we create this atmosphere where in order to get in and fit in, you've got to act like you've been holy all week long. You've got to come dressed in your Baptist beautiful. You've got to shout at the right time and shut up at the right time. You've got to know how to behave yourself in worship because this is Alfred Street Baptist Church. And there is a perception that you must be somewhere high on the socioeconomic ladder. You've got to have some degrees behind your name. You've got to make sure your subjects and your verbs are conjugated correctly when you are in this place. The problem with that is that it creates two hypocrisies that are killing the church. Number one is that in order to get in, uh, you've got to pretend you're holy when you're not. But that's not what really hurts the church. What hurts the church is not that you have to pretend you're holy when you're not. What hurts the church is you have to pretend you're not hurting when you are. That you come in and you gotta hide the real stuff you're dealing with. You gotta put makeup over your tears. You've got to put the right clothing over your burdens and you've got to act like you've got it all together. And I'm like Hezekiah. I can't worship with folk that act like they always got it going on, always got everything together. I'm sorry, but I'm looking for some folk that want to worship at Be Real Baptist Church. I just came to be real today. Is there anybody here not ashamed to admit I'm not always blessed and highly favored. I'm not always walking in the anointing. Sometimes I'm about to lose my mind. There are moments when I come to church, I don't want to act like a Levite and a priest. I want to be who I am. I want to cry. I want to be mad with God. I want you to know I got some stuff tearing my house up. And what hurts church is that you know church folk like I do, and you know you can't trust them with the real you. You, you. you can't handle the real me. You make me act fake because you can't handle the real me. You, you can handle the holy me and you can handle the Sunday me, but, but you ain't ready for my Friday night me. You, you ain't ready for the real me that I'm dealing with. I, I need some folk that can handle the real me. Can you handle the fact that I love Jesus, ha, but I cuss a little bit every now and then. Can you handle the real me? I got a Bible in my hand and some Hennessy in my kitchen, baby, because I just don't know which one I'm gonna need on Friday night. Is there anybody here that doesn't mind being real? Listen, listen, I didn't come to church to have to fake who I am. I didn't come to church to have to hide who I am. I didn't come to church to act like I got it all together. I want to be real. So Hezekiah said, look, we got to fix these doors because there's something broken when everybody's got to be holy in church. There's got to be a door for the sick. Got to be a door for the teenage mother. Got to be a door for the HIV. Got to be a door for the same gender love. Got to be a door for the drug addict. Got to be a door for the brokenhearted. Got to be a door for all of God's children. Love it. I know you don't want to hear this, but church is not a museum. 
where you showcase the prim and proper? Church is a rehab clinic. Everybody in here is struggling with something. You know, you know, I, I know you'll never do it, but, but you, know, you know why I like uh, sitting in some of those Alcohol Anonymous meetings and some of those other support groups? Because they're the realest folk you'd never want to meet in life. Oh, we, they so real, they introduce themselves like this. Hi, my name is Howard, and I'm a such and such. Uh, you know what? Church would be a whole lot better place uh, if when you pass the peace to somebody, when you shake their hand, you just tell them, hi, hi my name is such and such, uh, and I'm struggling with this, and God is working with me on this, and I'm getting delivered from this. I want to be real. As God said, listen, we're going to fix church. Can't just be for the holy and righteous. Has to be for the broken and the hurting and the struggling. So he opens the doors of the church. He invites the people in. And he notices a second problem that has to be fixed. Deacon Johnson, he says, listen, remove the defilement from the sanctuary. He looked in the house of God and saw defilement. Defilement in Hebrew is the word nadah. The transliteration is N-I-double-D-A-H. And nadah, Siobhan, doesn't just mean defilement. It means uncleanliness. It means filthiness. He saw filthiness. In, okay, I'm going give to give you a better translation. Nadah, mess. He says, in order to worship, not only do we need to fix the doors, but we've got to move the mess out the house of the Lord. Hezekiah understood something that I want to share with you, and I'm asking you to do me a favor. This is internal conversation. This is an internal memo that I'm about to share with you. This is not for you to share with your neighbors outside of church. Don't tell anyone what I'm about to tell you. This is private, confidential, internal communication. Are you ready? This is just for us. Church can get messy. Ooh, and ain't no mess. I'm preaching. You, you. Ain't no church like, ain't no mess like church mess. Ain't no offense like church offense. You ain't seen ugly till you've seen church ugly. You haven't been hurt until you've been hurt in church. Church can get messy. And Hezekiah realizes the mess interferes with worship. It's hard to worship in a messy church. It's hard to worship around folk who gossip more than they pray. It's hard to worship when you fighting and won't forgive, so you come to 930 because they come to 1130. It's hard to worship when you hear about scandal and missing money. Hard to worship in mess when pastors and deacons are fighting over what color to paint the bathroom. It's hard to worship in mess when you know the two altos are fighting over a no good tenor. It's just hard. <laughs> just, just. Somebody say that's messy, that's messy, that's messy. And messy interferes with worship. So Hezekiah says, listen, not only do we need to open the doors, we need to deal with the mess. He wants to get the mess out. Now the question you've got to ask is this, and I'm going to move. How did the mess get in the church? How, how does mess get in God's holy house? How does mess show up in the sanctuary? I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, don't look at nobody, don't look. Somebody brought it in. And here's how you fix church. It's real simple. 
Whatever you don't want to see in church, don't you bring it into church. If you don't want to see gossip, don't bring it in here. If you don't want to see ego, don't bring it in here. If you don't want to see jealousy, don't bring it in here. If you don't like judgment, don't bring it. Somebody say, get rid of the mess. Get rid of the mess. Open the doors, get rid of the mess, and watch what happens. The people come. And when the people come, they want to make sacrifices to God. So the text goes to great detail to tell you how many animals were brought to be sacrificed. Did you hear the numbers? 700 lamb, 1,000 sheep, 3,000 that, 1,000 this. All these animals had to be sacrificed. Now the problem was that only the priests could handle the sacrifice. And when they brought all these animals, the people found out that there weren't enough priests to handle the sacrifices. Well, well, that's, that's not right. That's not right. There weren't enough priests who got consecrated before worship to handle the sacrifice. Don't you miss this? There were some priests, but they weren't consecrated. There were some priests, but they weren't washed and clean. There were some priests who were not holy, who were not living right, who were not obeying God's will, and the people found out that the priests are not always holy. And worship is now in jeopardy because you found out that man that stands up there is just a man. You found out that sister who preaches struggles just like you. You found out they got issues the same way you got issues. And worship is put in jeopardy because the people found out the priest, the preacher, the pastor ain't always as holy as you want them to be. And that's a word because there's a generation now who the minute the priest, the preacher, the pastor is exposed as being unholy, they walk away from God. Here's the problem, y'all, who I came to preach. It is bad when a priest is unconsecrated. It is bad when a pastor's not righteous. It is bad when a preacher preaches where the preacher don't even live. That's messed up. But can I tell you what's even more messed up? It's even more messed up when you allow them to be lifted to a place they should have never been lifted to in the first place. Boy, I came by to preach. There's something wrong with lifting a man or a woman so high that you worship them and idolize them because when they fall and they will, the church comes crumbling down all around them. You can't build a church on one person. Because they will be exposed and the church comes crumbling down. There's something wrong with lifting a preacher, a pastor, a priest to a place no human should be. There's something wrong with a church where the pastor's name has more authority than the name of Jesus. There's something wrong entering a church and you see the pastor's picture on every place, even in the bathroom, and ain't a cross to be found in the sanctuary. There's something wrong when the pastor's name got to be called out at everything and the pastor has to sign every check and approve every vision and anoint every leader and do everything, play the organ, holler, shock, preach, all of that. Something is wrong when one person is lifted too high. That's dangerous. Oh, and I love being pastor of this church. Other than being a dad, this is the greatest thing God's ever done to me. But do me a favor, don't lift me too high. 
don't, don't, don't worship who I am. Don't, 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 don't call my name like that. Don't put me on a pillar. Put me on the prayer altar. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray that God keep me humble. Pray that God keep me low to the ground. Pray that Sister PYT don't catch my eye every Sunday. Somebody say, pray for pastor, pray for pastor. It's hard being up here. So, so the priests are not consecrated and worship is in jeopardy because the people have put too much authority on the priests. So watch what happens. When the priests were not consecrated, the Levites stepped up. And the Levites said, listen, it ain't our job, but we're going to make sure it happens. Because uh, when the priest isn't holy, there's some folk in the sanctuary who declare the priest ain't got to be perfect for me to worship God. I came to worship God, not the preacher, not the pastor, not the preacher. I came to worship God. I wish I had some people who came here today, not because of your pastor, but because of your God, who's been good to you. Do me a favor, tell somebody, tell them I came to worship God. Uh, uh, the church needs some people who come to worship even when I'm on vacation. Stop calling the church to find out who's preaching on Sunday. I didn't figure y'all out. I didn't figure y'all out. When I'm away, I park my car in the garage and leave it there anyway, because I know some of y'all, you drive by to see if the car's in the garage. Gotcha. <laughs> you shouldn't come here based on who's in the pulpit. I came here because God woke me up this morning. I came here because he started me on my way. I came here because he died on the cross. I came here to worship God. Uh, 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 uh. To fix the church, everybody's got to be welcome. Got to get the mess out. Have to have people who worship God and not the preacher. And then watch what happens, I'm done. As Kai gets the people in the sanctuary, all these folk have come from Beersheba to Dan, from north to south. They've gathered in Jerusalem and they're in the house of God. And while they're sitting in the house of God, Hezekiah realizes, I've got another problem. He says, because all these folk have come, but watch the problem. They have not celebrated Passover in a long time. They had the audacity to come all the way from Beersheba to Dan and find themselves in the house of God, but they had not celebrated Passover in a long time. You do know what Passover was. It was when the children of Israel paused to remember what the Lord had done. They let their minds go all the way back to Egypt and how the Lord brought them out of slavery. They celebrated that they were standing at the Red Sea and God made a way out of no way. They celebrated that while they were in the wilderness and they could not take care of themselves, God fed them with manna from heaven. God gave them water from a rock and God guided them by night with a pillar of fire and by day with a pillar of cloud. They remembered that when our enemies came upon us, the Lord protected us. That when scorpions bit us, we did not die. And they had not paused to remember the God that made a way. 
the God that had provided and the God that had kept them. So Hezekiah said, hold on. I can't worship with folk that get in the house of God and ain't got no memory of what the Lord has done. I can't worship with somebody who thinks they got here all by themselves. I need somebody who when they sit in the house of God, they remember if it had not been for the Lord on my side. Is there anybody here that knows God's been good to you? The Lord's made ways for you. The Lord has opened doors for you. I need you to pause and praise God for what the Lord has already done. But wait, it gets gooder. The Bible says that they celebrated Passover on the second month. And that's a violation because Passover is to be celebrated in the first month. They celebrated at the wrong time. They shouted at the wrong time. They got happy at the wrong time. And I start talking to Hezekiah. I said, Hezekiah, you're supposed to celebrate in the first month and you gave glory in the second month. You are a month too late. And Hezekiah talked back to me, yes he did. He said, Howard John, I need you to know something. That when you know how good God has been, and you know how many ways God has made, how many prayers God has answered, it's never too late to praise God. too late to clap my hands. It's not too late to say thank you. It's not too late. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and everything. I will, I will, I will. Bless the Lord at all. say it's never too late. Thank you, God. I'll praise you right now for what you did last week. It's never too late to praise the Lord. How do we fix the church? It's simple. Make certain that when you come in here, you know you owe God some thanksgiving. I know you've had a bad week. I know life gets rough. But don't ever come to the house of God and act like you got here on your own. How do we fix the church? We pray for our pastors, don't elevate them. And come to worship not based on who's here, but who's there. How do we fix church? Don't bring the mess into the house of the Lord. We fix the church by opening the door so that all may come. So I want you to know today there's a door for you. If you've been broken, if you've fallen short, if you know you ain't been close to what God called you to be, if your life is frazzled in every way, there's a door for you. Because you are welcome in this space. Listen, don't, don't, don't let the reputation and image of who we are make you believe that you're not welcome here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether you got on Prada, Payless, or Puma, you are welcome yeah. to come in this place and worship God because everybody needs a church. Yeah. So our deacons come to receive those whom the Lord would call on this day. And if by chance you're here and you want to walk through the door God has for you to receive the invitation of new life and family and faith, we say to you, the door is open. Let's stand all over this place as some brother, some sister makes a decision to come to this place today believing God has something in store for them. If you're here and you desire the love of Jesus Christ in your life or you desire to join this church family, we say to you, it's real simple. I need you and you need me in order to survive.
the door of the church is open just for you.